Tonight on EWT and Live, we'll talk about saints, scoundrels, and those who would misinterpret Scripture for their own political motives. Ain't that something? You just stay with us, we'll talk about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. But before we get to our guests, I just want to remind you that today is the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena. She was born in 1347, the very same year that the pl Black Plague, the Bonnet Plague, hit Europe and her own town of Siena. Many died. And she was uh, born with a twin. Her twin died. Uh, she was the 24th of her family's kids. There were 22 older kids. Can you imagine if the dad had said, his name is Bartolomeo, uh, you know, honey, let's stop at 22. <laughs> <laughs> we would have lost out on the great doctors of the church. And then uh, she, they also had one more child after that. And the... Um, she was someone who was, first of all, called by God. She was given great graces of mystical experiences of God that truly deepened her. But she was also used by God to go around to Italy where they were fighting each other. It was like a, a bunch of gangs among all the nobles fighting each other for power. And it was petty, petty stuff. But... In that process, she helped bring peace. She was sent to help bring peace between Florence and the Pope. And she also got Pope Gregory XI to return back to Italy from where he was then living in Avignon, France. So this is a great, great saint, great doctor of the church, not only a co-patroness of Italy with St. Francis of Assisi, but a, one of the co-patrons of all Europe. All right, we had planned to have as our guest tonight David Nalieri, who is a writer and a director of a wonderful new documentary that was sponsored by the Knights of Columbus. It's called John Paul II in America, Uniting a Continent. I watched it. It is superb. It will, the documentary will still debut tonight on EWTN at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. But... They, he can't be here because of travel difficulties due to weather. He's, he's stuck in an airport, not here. So uh, he can't get here. So we regret not having him. But on the other hand, like the great uh, uh, Catherine of Siena, we trust in God's providence. And we have a guest with us tonight. He has been uh, giving EWTN viewers front row seats to debates between some of history's most interesting and infamous characters in his dramatic EWTN series called Saints vs. Scoundrels. He's also partnered with Scott Hahn to write an exceptional book. I love this book. It is called Politicizing the Bible, The Roots of Historical Criticism and the Secularization of Scripture. This book discusses discusses the history and effects of biblical interpretation, especially the way it's used for, for pol by politicians for political purposes. Sounds relevant to today, right? <laughs> so please welcome the host of Saints and Scoundrels and the co-author of Politicizing the Bible, Dr. Benjamin Weicker. <laughs> Good to have you here. <laughs> I don't think EWTN's religious catalog carries this book yet. Um, it, it's not, well, it, it's a good, do they have it? Yeah, they do have it. Okay, good. See, it's light have. reading. They should have it. 
Uh, no, it's not it's light not reading. reading. That's not right. No, 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 no. no don't all. we don't start off the, this uh, program with falsehoods? No, this no. is not a political debate. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stick with the facts here. The facts. Um, okay. But should you have any trouble sleeping? This is a wonderful way to go to sleep with great facts and important insights, and then try it again the next day. No, it, it, it's it's a, it's it's a very important. A uh, scholarly, detailed read of uh, key elements of history that, and it's one of the reasons I've been fascinated with it. Over the years, you know, I've studied a lot about the theology of Martin Luther mm -hmm. and uh, uh, certainly John Calvin, mm -hmm. uh, Huldreich Zwingli, and some of the other reformers of the Protestant Reformation. And I've also studied a lot about Islam. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, I can't figure this out. It sounds like some key elements of Muslim theology about using the sacred text alone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also key ideas about human will being totally at God's disposal. God yeah. wills everything and he has complete control of the will. And I said, I know that's not in Christian past, but it's there. And it never, I, I never saw them citing yeah. any yeah. Muslim texts. You've kind of helped open up a way to see the link in this book. Yeah, and it's an important link. Exactly. Uh, too, because you don't, you don't realize how all these things come together to create a situation where the Bible is so easily manipulated by political authority. Yes. And in order to do that, what had to be undermined was the church's authority over the Bible. Right. See, how do you undermine that? Well, that was a long story, but once you undermine that and uh, uh, you're able, the, the political order is able to, to, to absorb the text and have authority over it for its own purposes. One of the things that allowed that was the doctrine of sola scriptura, as you, as you point out, uh, which everyone associates with Martin Luther, but it goes all the way back to the early 1300s uh, to Marsilius of Padua. And before that, as you mentioned, it comes from Averroes uh, now, let, let's, in Islam. Let's, we're tossing around some we're names tossing around. here. Okay. Come on, let's slow down. Let, let, slow down. Let, let's, let's, let's pace this horse. <laughs> okay. We don't want to run it to death. No, we don't. So, first of all, to understand, the, in Muslim theology, the key revelation is the Quran. The Quran, yeah. And the Quran is, you know, something that's given. And one of the points that it makes, and that Muslims make, is that uh, they believe, and it's written, that priests and rabbis changed the Old Testament by the rabbis and the New Testament by the priests and that this is a corrective. Same kind of claim that, for instance, Joseph Smith makes mm -hmm. many centuries later with his Book of Mormon. So that's one way that they avoid the authority of the church and say only the Quran and the accepted tradition of Muhammad is acceptable as an authority, but the Quran is the primary authority and you go by the book. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. Now, who's Averroes? Where are you getting him from? Well, Averroes, uh, if, to make a really long story short, um, what he provides is a way out for uh, philosophers, Muslim philosophers, to get out from under the authority of the Quran. And so, what he he, he advocates uh, is a kind of a doctrine of a double truth. So uh, you have the truths in accordance with the Quran. Uh, and they're not amenable to, to reason. And then you have the truth of reason. And so you could separate those two, and so you have this double truth, uh, and uh, you know, in keeping them apart, you have absolute uh, acceptance of what appears in the Quran. You're not able to question it. That's why you have to set reason to the side. Right. And that finds its way again into um, European Christian thought in the early 1300s. Well, and, and just to, to, to also use that as a final note on Averroes, mm -hmm. he was himself condemned yep. by Muslim yes. religious authorities yes. because they would not accept the double truth yes. theory. Yeah. They said, no, only the Quran and that the truth 
that disagrees with the Quran is rejected. Yes. Yeah. And so, so he got you know, rejected. But now, how did he influence Christians? Well, you bring this into European history in a very strange way. You, you've got a, a conflict between the German emperors in the papacy and uh, Marsilius of Padua, this is in the early 1300s, to make, again, a uh, long story short, he's, he's siding with the emperor and he wants to figure out a way to get scriptural authority out of the church so the church can't use scriptural authority against the emperor to control them. It can't quote scripture to and control them. Could I just give a couple details to help in, yeah. why, why was the emperor so upset? Keep in mind at this point, I believe it was in 1307, 1308, mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, Pope, uh, even before that, Pope Boniface mm. the Eighth had gotten into a big dispute with the King of France, Philip the Fourth, mm -hmm. and they, they ex he, the Pope excommunicated him. He wanted to arrest the Pope and get some bishops to excommunicate the Pope, but the Pope died. <laughs> the new Pope was a Frenchman, and he was still in France, and because of fighting in Italy, he stayed in France, mm -hmm. and that happened for a couple popes, and. The problem came because the emperor of Germany had to be crowned by the pope mm -hmm. as Holy Roman Emperor. But the pope was in France, which was the emperor's enemy. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is part of the dispute going on between them. Take it from there. Well, it, and again, it creates this age old conflict uh, between the emperor and the pope. And again, it's uh, how do we get, you know, th thinking here, here you're a secular person, how do you get this, this authority of uh, the Pope over the state, over the emperor? You've got to undermine that. So again, this figure Mar Marcellius wants to undermine that by arguing that the scripture is, uh, is, is a sola scripture principle. Uh, you don't need the authority of the church with that sola scripture principle, uh, the emperor himself could be you know, a legitimate interpreter of scripture. So it's gonna sound a little like what's gonna happen later with the priesthood of all believers with, uh, with uh, Luther. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of line going around there where you're subordinating uh, the, the scripture to the state. The state is claiming then that it, it can uh, use the scripture for its means against the church. And again, the whole point is to undermine that the authority of the church against the state. And we're gonna see this play out uh, you know, into somebody like Machiavelli, uh, into Hobbes and Locke, other figures, but it's going to create the context for modern scriptural scholarship. And that's where we're going with this, because it's not just about way back then. Right. It's about now, because what you have right now with people going into colleges and universities, not Franciscan, uh, university, but other ones, they go there and they, they, they want to study scripture. They come in and they study scripture according to the historical critical method. And they come out on the other side and they're entirely secularized. They don't believe there are any miracles. They don't believe that Jesus was divine. They don't believe he was resurrected. All the miracles are flushed out. It becomes merely a, a you know, some kind of a fairy tale for 2000 years ago. Where did that come from? We can trace it all the way back to the desire to secularize scripture so that it can't be used by the church against the state. And see, this tension is an extremely important tension that goes all the way back to Constantine. Mm -hmm. You know, Constantine wanted peace in the church, not because he, he wasn't even a Christian <laughs> at that time. He just didn't want any fighting. He wanted peace in the empire. And you see that this tension of the emperors in Constantinople mm -hmm. and their you know, dispute with the patriarchs of Constantinople, mm -hmm. where they get to a point where who is in charge of the faith? Is it the emperor or is it the patriarch? Yes, yeah. And emperors will kick patriarchs they don't like out of the yeah. city. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John Chrysostom yeah. gets exiled. Uh, St. Athanasius, Athanasius gets right. exiled four times because politicians are worried about their power yes, yeah. and they are threatened 
by the church. Yeah, and they also want to, you know, they have this notion that, that, that uh, if we're going to have religion, it's got to be a big tent. And so you find even in the 400s and the 500s, the emperors trying to push creeds that kind of make everybody happy. Heretics, non-heretics, we're a big tent here. And they're trying to enforce those creeds on the church. Right. Well, that was maybe the great grandfather of this notion of secularizing scripture. And uh, happily, the popes at that time, Pope Galatius was one who said, no, there, there are two powers in the world, not just one, the church and the state. Keep your hands off the Bible. Right. <laughs> so right. right. The we're Bible in charge of that. Your tool. The Bible's not your tool. We <laughs> are in charge of how to interpret it. And so, uh, it, you know, it's established for centuries that the church was the one who properly understood, passed on the proper interpretation of Scripture. And that, in that 1300s we keep referring to, that's when that authority tried to wrest it out of their power and put it in the state. What are you going to find? You're going to find watered down, manipulable creeds. Uh, you're not going to find the truth. And see, one of the things going on, yeah, again, keep this in mind, uh, for our audience, uh, Christians had recently rediscovered Aristotle. Mm -hmm. it, you know, Plato, everybody studied, mm -hmm. but the texts of Aristotle were known in the East, and they came to the West through the Muslims. Oh, yeah. They brought them, the Christian monks of the Middle East translated Aristotle into Arabic, mm -hmm. and then they brought those texts to the West. And, you know, the, the Christians in the West found this a fascinating new way to think. Thomas Aquinas and, uh, you know, uh, Albert the Great and St. Bonaventure, all of them were taken up. Mm -hmm. But now, in this period, because of this politics, and also because the popes were not exactly exemplary, <laughs> they, they were efficient, more efficient than they had been, they became wealthier and they became more corrupt in, in, when they lived in France. Yeah. So that also hurt. And so there's now a rejection of Thomas Aquinas and of Veroes and his ideas of double truth yeah. come into I mean, play. Yeah, exactly. Because the politicians can manipulate that. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, the, the, <coughs> then you have what you would call the misuse of Aristotle. I think it was with C.J. Brabant was, uh, you know, uh, Aristotle is giving you the whole truth. We now know we don't need faith anymore. We don't need scripture. Uh, philosophy says everything. Well, this is again, this is a Veroes. And you say, well, what about scripture? Well, it's by faith alone. You hold it, uh, you, 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 there's nothing rational about it, uh, and, and you just accept what's in the word, but you have philosophy over here and that gives you another truth. So you have a double truth that is not Catholic. Catholic is the truth builds upon, you know, the truth, supernatural, supernatural truth builds a natural truth. This is two distinct truths. And that, that, that is heretical. It leads to all kinds of problems. And the Catholic Church has been insistent on that. All, all the way, to, that was a big issue still in Vatican I mm -hmm. uh, back in 1870. You know, that, that the truth is unified. Yes. And you don't have this double truth. Uh, you may have in Scripture forms of speech from the ancient world, and you have ancient languages and such as that, but the truth about the world is, is at one. Mm -hmm. And this double truth, one pure reason and philosophy and government, and government, yeah, that, that's, that's the that's, political, yeah. That, that's, yeah. Where the yeah. that's the reason you do, that they, yeah. they were interested in this. For the sake of the government, pure reason, and then over here is faith. Mm -hmm. And you take the Bible on faith alone, and you only use the Bible for your faith. Yeah. This is where believe in the Bible by faith alone, yeah. without, without reason, and believing in the Bible alone. This was never part of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible to yeah. believe in the yeah. Bible alone. And it's also um, not something that was taught in the church before this. Yeah. It's with, you know, the, this period of politics getting involved. Yeah, and, and it gets involved in all kinds of nasty ways as things progress. Uh, that's one of the difficulties, and I don't know how much time we'll have in tracing that, 
but the more manipulable you make scripture, uh, the less it has connection to the church, the more the state is going to absorb religious power and use it for its own means. Mm -hmm. It's going to allow you to believe anything you want. Now, in a way it looks like, oh, we're so ben beneficial, we're gonna allow you to believe anything you want, well, as long as you obey the rules of the state. Well, see, that's what I was gonna say. As long as you obey that's the rules one of the, the state. great things your book points um, out, that Wycliffe yes. is another, a person who kind of picks up on this because he's trying to promote the power of the King of England, yes. who at that time wants to take over France. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's trying, and the Hundred Years' War is getting started. They want to justify why should we take over f France? And Wycliffe is using the Bible to say King David had control over the priest of the Old Testament, so the King of England should have control over the bishops of England. And sets up nicely for Henry VIII. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so he becomes, uh, you know, he literally declares himself the head of the church. Also, the, the one who will interpret scripture, even tell you how many, you know, what, what books are you going to have in the Bible. And uh, a, a later philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, picks up on that, mm -hmm. uh, who was an atheist, but he understood, hey, we got to subordinate that church and scripture to the state. Now the church and scripture comes under the state. And that's what yes. you have with Henry VIII. Now everything is under the state. Mm -hmm. You got a state church, state church defines what scripture says, everything supports the state. And that is the exact reverse of how it should be. You see even within the Protestant Reformation, as the, because the ideas of Wycliffe mm -hmm. went over to Bohemia. Yes. Because the King of England married a princess of Bohemia and the University of Prague picks up Wycliffe's ideas and applies it there. Yeah, John Huss. Exactly. Yeah. John Huss uh, brings those ideas, and then his ideas eventually get to Luther, and Luther also is supporting Philip of Hesse, mm -hmm. one of the German nobles, who doesn't like the emperor, because he wants to be emperor. Mm -hmm. And that you see that the other Protestant reformers are also dealing with differences about interpretation of Scripture, partly because some of them are in cities like Geneva, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, I hold like Swingley is in uh, I forget the city. Switzerland. He's in Switzerland, but yeah. what city he was in? Oh. Which canton oh. was in I Geneva? Remember, yeah, but, yeah. Um, uh, Zurich. Zurich. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's in Zurich. And so they are interpreting it for an urban city council mm -hmm. under politicized version. Mm -hmm. And this just keeps splitting up the, the Protestant Reformation against each other as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah it's, a different, it's an interesting parallel because what you have all the way back in the 1300s is you have Marsilius of Padua siding with the emperor. He wants to take sola scripture, give the power to interpret things uh, uh, to the emperor, to the to the state, against the uh, against the church, against the pope. Well, Luther has a parallel. He wants to get the power of the church uh, decreased, and in order to do that, he takes it from the church and puts it in the state. So Luther himself did that. He simply uh, duplicated what Marsilius of Padua did. And as you say, the the result was that you had as many beliefs as you have states. Or, or the, the religion of the prince is the religion of the, of the realm. Right. Which is, you know, how could that be? be? There's, as many, there's as many forms of Christianity as there are political entities now. Right. I, it's one of the real ironies. Only one country in Europe gave religious freedom. Do you know what it was? I... The Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. Okay, okay, yeah. They, allowed, they didn't... <clears throat> persecuted anybody for the religion. Mm -hmm. But the king was still Catholic and he invited the Jesuits to come in and start schools and theaters. And they won the people back to Catholicism. It had become predominantly Lutheran mm -hmm. in Poland mm -hmm. uh, and Calvinist. Mm -hmm. But they won them back with the schools, but they didn't have that kind of religious war among Protestants yeah. and Catholics there. Yeah. But everywhere else, uh, they didn't use religious freedom. <coughs> One, <coughs> One of the figures in your book, <coughs> excuse me, that's very important for your new series, 
is Machiavelli. <laughs> you know, you're talking about yeah. him in this new series. He's yes. the scoundrel. He's the scoundrel. You've got St. Francis St. as Francis? the saint. Yes. But the scoundrel, the scoundrels have their own kind of interest. It, it, yeah. What was his attitude of state, church, and faith? It, his is very interesting. He's in the early 1500s. He is really the first great modern atheist. And what he wants to do is uh, he thinks Christianity was a mistake. He wants to return to the pre-pagan world. Right. So it would turn to that pre-pagan world. In the pre-pagan world, you had a state religion. That is, you had a religion under the Roman emperor. And, and Roma was one of the chief goddesses. Yes, yeah. You worshipped Roma. You worship Rome. So you literally worship the state. And what Machiavelli argued, this, this church, this Christianity thing, divides the power between the, the prince and the pope. And the pope always wins because he's got the trump card, you know, excommunication, he can send you to hell, all that stuff. So Machiavelli wants to undo Christianity. He literally wants to roll back, go back to pre-pagan times. And that meant when the church, not what well, wouldn't have been the church, when the religion is under the state and you've got a state religion under control of the political figures, in order to do that, what he has to do is provide a way to, to give a secularized reading of Scripture. And so he is really at the origin of modern scriptural scholarship. He undermines all the miracles in Scripture. He shows you uh, how all the figures in Scripture, like Moses, are actually clever manipulators of religion so that they can have political power. Exactly. Right? So what you have is the beginning of the kind of exegesis that finds its way into the 19th and even 20th century where it's all power politics. You know, there's no truth. It's just 21st too. Yeah, 21st too. Yeah, 21st too. yeah, unfortunately, you know, here's Moses uh, up there chiseling the Ten Commandments, pretending God is talking to him. He comes down, you know, that allows him to control people so that he can have them under him. And so Machiavelli paints him as a political figure that manipulates religion just as the ancient pagans, the wise pagans understood. That means that he gives a reading of the Bible which completely undermines any divine authority so that it can appear uh, now as this is just one more religion. It's not any better or worse than any of the ancient Roman religions. It's for fools, but the smart princes know how to manipulate the people using religion. And if you want to see that portrayed in modern terms, mm -hmm. Watch the new movie about the Exodus that just came oh, out. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I that didn't, is e yeah. exactly Purely it's political. Machiavelli's vision of Moses. Yeah, Machiavelli's Moses. Yeah. And, you know, so that's what's going on. And they're, they're trying to, the, the, the people in the media are trying to lull us mm -hmm. to sleep to accept, well, of course, a political version of religion is more important mm. because we'll help more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help more people do bad things yeah. is what they end up <laughs> yeah. doing usually. Yeah. But, you know, remove God, we'll get along, and we'll just get the political issues done. And this, be, this was the same thing with liberation theology mm -hmm. in the hands of some of the liberationists. Yeah. They used Moses and the Exodus as a way to say, this is a symbol of a Marxist revolution in our country. Yeah. I met some folks like that in Peru. So this is something that you know, we, uh, is still going on. It began in the 1300s, and it's going on today. And we're going to come back for a break. I have to take a break now. I um, want to get you to uh, have more information about Dr. Ben Weicker's books by going to BenjaminWeicker.com. You can learn more about the award. You can get them from EWTN's Religious Catalog as well because they're good. <laughs> I like them a lot. We'll be back with your questions and questions from our studio audience, so please stay with us.
Welcome back. First of all, I want to uh, invite you to come here and join us to uh, be here in the studio audience. If you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN, we'd love to have you. You can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or contact them on the website, which is EWTN. Dot com. They'll give you information about times for masses and tours of the studios, times for programs, information on how to get up to Hansville and visit the sisters in the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament. So we'd love to have you come. You ready for some questions? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's get here. Fire in. away. Start off with this lady over here. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Pensacola, Florida. Good to have you. And what is your question? My question is, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, are they all different or are they the same? Okay, so are sacred tradition and sacred scripture different or are they the same? Well, that's, that's, if, if we took the route that many of the people that we're talking about did, you would divide those things. But the church, uh, it, it, we should know this, the uh, New Testament didn't fall from the sky uh, when Jesus was, uh, in, uh, went into heaven. Uh, the church itself had a life as scripture was written and gathered together and uh, became officially canon, uh, a canon. So that tradition of interpretation, that tradition of the apostles saying, this is what Jesus said, was actually what defined what got into scripture. So the church is, uh, the, the living church passing on from the apostles, what it had, uh, what it had learned, what it had seen, uh, is the foundation for us having not only a New Testament, but how we understand the Old Testament's relationship to the New Testament. So fitting in what we were uh, talking about, uh, that sacred tradition is what passes the sacred scriptures on. It's what helped to form them uh, and when you say, well, we, we're going to divide church authority from scriptural authority and uh, say that we just have sola scriptura, that breaks that chain. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the chain that was originally there, how we got scripture to begin with. As a matter of fact, um, it's important to note the Bible never once says, use the Bible mm -hmm. alone. <laughs> that is from the 1300s. Yeah. That's uh, William of Ockham mm -hmm. you know, says that you, by faith alone, you use the Bible alone. Mm -hmm. And the Bible never says that. And that's important because believing in the Bible alone is a late tradition of men based on philosophy. Mm -hmm. And a secularizing philosophy. That's the thing that's a little shocking to people. And then you see that the Bible does say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, where St. Paul writes, hold on to the traditions which I left you, mm -hmm. whether by word or by letter. Mm -hmm. So he, the Bible does teach holding on to the traditions that are written, and that's where the Bible is, so that helps to get your distinction. The Bible is the written tradition. And then the word or the oral tradition. And uh, I, I remember being in a debate in Dallas some years ago, and my, we were talking about Scripture alone or Scripture and tradition. And my interlocutor said, is there anything in the tradition that is not already in the Bible? which is an admission that the Bible and the tradition go together. They don't contradict each other. But I didn't pick on that. <laughs> uh, he asked a question, is there anything in the tradition that is not in the Bible? And I smiled and I looked across the audience. And I said, yes, the table of contents. <laughs> You don't know what books go in the Bible. What you see up until the uh, late 300s is that they typically had only 22 books in the New Testament. 
and not the same 22 books because the different parts of the church yeah. only had some manuscripts because of the Roman persecutions. Mm -hmm. But once the persecutions were over, Pope Damasus sent St. Jerome all over to find out what does everybody have. And then he, and then later uh, in 382, then uh, the council, St. Augustine, and the councils in the 390s, decreed we have 73 books. Mm -hmm. And without the tradition, Martin Luther got rid of seven books in the New Testament for a while, then he put them back. Because he's doing his own thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When he was in uh, Wartsburg uh, Castle, he got rid of seven books yeah. and put them back. And then he got rid of seven books in the Old Testament. Yeah. And, and, and then the King James Bible had those seven books in the Old Testament in 1611, but it took them out in 1627. And in some later editions, put them back. You, you, you're bouncing like in a pinball machine without the tradition yep. to guide you. Yep. That's important. And it isn't, just, it isn't just how many books are in the Bible. Luther focused on a very small, narrow interpretation of how you understand the entire Bible, what he had right. left over. Right. So that is another way of throwing away that tradition where you have the broad, deep understanding of it. And here, this is all I'm going to take, a certain understanding of St. Paul that sounds like you're saved by faith alone, no works, and all of a sudden it becomes unclear why you have sacraments. That aspect falls out. They get, uh, the Protestants then fight back and forth because they don't have any authoritative tradition to say, are there any sacraments, are there not? Things further unwind, but that plays into the political powers. Exactly. That plays into political power. Yeah. But as soon as the church is ununified, it's a lot easier to control. Yep. And, yeah. and a lot of these uh, political powers wanted to multiply the number of interpretations because it's divide and conquer. You divide and conquer once you don't have a unified uh, uh, power, you don't have a unified authoritative teaching church, you have a multitude of sects which you can then play off each other and the political power is the one that wins. One of the ironies is that by the late 1600s, hmm. you see philosophers start to say, Religion is the biggest cause of war. <laughs> yes, exactly. But mm -hmm. the problem was that the religious wars of the 1520s to the 1670s, mm -hmm. that 150 years of Christian, inter-Christian uh, religious war, was because they politicized the yes, Bible. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It wasn't because of the faith. It was the politicization of the Bible mm -hmm that used religion and that caused the wars. Mm -hmm. But they still were not the worst wars. The secular and atheist wars of the 20th century by far were worse. Yeah, absolutely. You can't, you you can't, can't, even, you, you can't even compare them. Uh, and, and there are so many other cause of wars, nationalism, dynastic considerations. This is true even in the Thirty Years' War. Yes. So the notion that religion is the cause of war, in particular Christianity, was yeah. a kind of a banner of the Enlightenment that caused further secularization. It caused a distorted understanding of the relationship of church and state, that we need to separate the church and religion, get it out of the public square because you guys are all slitting each other's throats. Right. Well, what, that plays into the hands of secularization. Poli yeah, it's a secular movement. You, you, you pretend as if Christianity is the cause of all problems because they can't agree with each other, even when you're whipping up their differences. And then you say, well, you guys are always at each other's throats. That means you can't say anything. Christianity is out. We're going to have an entirely secular order. And this, what we're talking about in here, uh, is, the, is the final result. It's the secularization of the entire political order. And religion is reduced at most to something the equivalent of what is your favorite flavor of ice cream. It doesn't have any power. And, and worse, you see two other principles. One, in the Soviet Union's constitution, it says there is separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And that is brought into the U.S. Supreme Court. It's not in our Constitution. No. People have to remember no. that. That it's is not, not in, in the, the Constitution. Constitution. No. <laughs> it was in a Supreme Court brought in by Justice Hugo Black, yeah. a former member of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1947, Everson versus Board of Education. There you go. That's exactly it. Second problem is they say we want freedom of worship. 
the President Obama. I talks heard him about say that. that. That's a red light. Red, that is ooh, red flag. That's what the Soviets gave. Yeah. Which means keep religion inside your church. Don't bring religion outside. Yeah. Watch for that. Watch for that. Let's go to a call. Hello, Steve. Yes, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from uh, Indiana, but I teach uh, philosophy and theology in a small Catholic college in northern Kentucky. Good for you. And what is your, what, what college, is that St. Thomas More College? Yes, Father. <laughs> I, I studied there back in 68. Anyway. Really? Yes, sir. Really? Well, I love your show and your, your wonderful presentation and your guest. Thank you. So and your Jesuit genius. Uh, but my <laughs> question is, um, what, well, what come do to you and your guest... meetings. I'll show you some real geniuses. They got some smart ones over there. But go ahead. What's your question? Okay. Uh, what do you and your guests think of uh, theocracy? Well, that's interesting. Um, if you go back, well, first of all, define it. The theocracy would be the notion that the church simply absorbs the state. There really isn't a distinction. It would be the the state entirely subordinate under the church. You might look at Islam as the primary example. Exactly. You know, in, in other words, it, it's from the Quran on down. It's entirely religious. It defines everything. Uh, that is not what is uh, from the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the actual inventor of the distinction between the church and political power uh, going all the way back. I mean, take it all the way back into the Old Testament, but it's really obvious in the fourth, fifth, sixth century popes saying, you know, there are two powers, not one. There's the priestly power and the kingly power. Uh, and one of the main things we want to protect is we want to protect the kingly power from corrupting the church and merely using uh, dogma and doctrine and the Bible for its own purposes. And we want to protect the church from corruption by becoming worldly and political. So we need to distinguish between the two powers. Uh, so it's actually the Catholic Church that doesn't allow theocracy. You have a distinction, but they aren't, it isn't a distinction which is a separation and antagonism. It's not that. So it's one where the, the, the powers are complementary and that's the proper relationship. So the Catholic Church is not actually one of theocracy. The, the Orthodox Church in the East, you will have more of something like that. Islam, Calvin's Geneva, but not, not the Catholic Church. Yeah, and when, uh, the, the, one of the things that did happen was the Roman Empire basically abandoned Italy because yeah. they couldn't control it. They couldn't it. control it, yeah. And the Pope became de facto ruler. But that was a, okay for a while when there was chaos. Yeah. But the church is much better off not having control of the papal states. It is. It was one of those gifts that we should have said, I think that I'll just give that one back. Yeah, you can, yeah, you you can, can have that, that one back yeah, it, because it can't come out the well. the worst periods of the church's history in the 10th century was the worst. Yeah. Um, but 15th and, and early 16th yeah. century were bad, really bad too. Yeah, and it isn't Those just... Those are terrible times. Yeah, exactly. Because the, they controlled the papal states. Exactly, the, the Italian nobles. It's not like, it's, it's, some people think, well, it, it's actually because you have bad popes. What you have is Italian nobles trying to control the papacy. That, for its political For its power. political purposes, yeah. 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 That was bad. That was bad. Don't do that again. No. No. <laughs> Sir, your question. Yes, uh, you're describing a problem that's been going on for several hundred years mm -hmm. in this day we and age. We didn't start it. Like, we did not start it. Yeah. Like, the, like the last caller said, the, the charges leveled against uh, the church, that the, a theocracy is what's in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, 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 and they point to fundamental Protestantism, quite frankly, when, when they stake that, when they make that charge. My question is, what is the effective resolution to the problem as a Catholic in a Western democracy in the 21st century? And that would be the resolution of the problem of how to relate the church and the state or how to, uh, how should we properly understand the uh, scripture and secularization and the things we've been talking about. How do, you how do you resolve the conflict where the state is trying to secularize scripture? Well, the first thing we need to do is go back into the places where we're actually teaching scriptural scholarship on the undergraduate and graduate level because that is, that, uh, uh, is a nest of bad uh, education now. It's, it's, it's simply carrying forth the secularization of scripture, making it academic doctrine that you can't even question. And one of the reasons Scott Hahn and I wrote this book 
as a kind of a bomb and it's big and heavy and thick uh, is to throw this in there uh, and, and say, look, you folks who are teaching the historical critical method and end up destroying the miracles, uh, removing all that is sacred and treating it like another uh, secular text, uh, have got to understand that your ideas came from rotten sources. And we need to get back to that origin to find out where did we first begin to secularize scripture itself? Uh, and uh, how do we understand how that deforms the historical critical method? And this was something that Pope Benedict demanded. We need to be a critical about the historical critical method itself. So first thing we have to do is, is save biblical studies from itself because these other people are getting their authority from the biblical studies. Something, something else that we have to deal with too. I, I, I think, you know, you know, Catholics and Jews um, by the 1960s became the two best educated religious groups in the country. The Jews were ahead of the Catholics, but the Catholics were right behind them. We also became the, the, the two wealthiest religious groups. We, we out-educated all the other religious groups and, and become wealthier as religious communities. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to then say, not that that's a triumph, but that's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in the face, we, we have people who are trying to, to, to further secularize the church. Just last Thursday, um, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton mm. spoke at a meeting of women leaders in New York saying, we must get the churches to change their doctrine when it comes to women's health issues, i.e. Abortion, abortion and birth control. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do as Catholics is know the Constitution better than she does and commit ourselves to it and let her and any other politician of any party know we are here to bring you to know the real Jesus Christ. We want to know the truth about life. Mm -hmm. And when it begins, from the moment that it starts at conception, you must protect it, and that you have no role in changing it. You cannot keep to your own principles. Mm -hmm. Eight years ago, she said, it is my bed rock solid belief that marriage is between a man and a woman. In eight years, her bedrock belief has become a quicksand yeah. because she now rejects it. Yeah. Her bedrock ideas only look like rock, they're quicksand, yeah. and they mean nothing. And she's not, I just mentioned her because she's been coming out saying that she wants yeah. to change the church's teaching on same-sex marriage, on life issues, and we are here to say, no, we are Catholics, and we are here to evangelize this society, and you are not here to change our doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to stand up as American citizens for our right to protect freedom of religion, not worship only. No, not worship. Yeah. Freedom of religion, which is stated that Congress shall not establish a religion nor interfere in the practice thereof. That right comes before your right of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. And if we Catholics use the gift of our education to stand up for what is right and true, then we'll be doing what we have to do in the society to prevent that secularization. Yeah, and that's, that, that illustration of what Hillary Clinton is doing, is it's exactly a duplicate of what Marsilius was doing in the 1300s. Exactly. He's saying, we don't like these doctrines. We as politicians want to uh, control the doctrines and form them in accordance with what we want to do. That means we've got to undercut the authority of what's standing in our way. <laughs> exactly. And he says, that's why they made up an entire way to approach scripture, which undermined the church's authority and made scripture putty in their hands. Mm -hmm. Basically, she's saying the same thing. Yep. 
And as to repeat Pope Galatius in the end of the 400s, there are two powers, keep your hands off the church. <laughs> and every single one of us Catholics needs to understand yeah. that her political positions are things that she doesn't believe in dying for. No. Our faith in Jesus Christ is worth living and dying for. And that this, we will be judged not by her or, in, or Obama or the Republicans or any other politician. We will be judged by G Jesus Christ and so will they. Yeah. That is the one truth that all, holds all the world together. And we all need to tremble before that judgment comes. Yeah. And we older guys getting closer to it, so we've got to be careful. <laughs> Let's go over to Jim. Hello, Jim. Well, hello. Uh, I'm calling from Florida. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's your question? Well, I, uh, I was, uh, before, uh, I've been on the, on the phone for a while, and a while back you were talking about the Reformation. Yes. And uh, so I was interested in, the, in your comments and the professor's uh, take on uh, what I was going to say, which is that during the Reformation you were talking about the various internecine Christian wars that were going on, but there was another war that was going on also. Yes, that's right. And that was the invasion of the Ottoman Empire uh, that was, uh, that was uh, exactly at the same time that the Protestant Reformation was going on in present-day Germany and Europe. And there are many historians who say to this day that Suleiman the Magnificent at the gates of Vienna uh, had more to do with the success of the Protestant Reformation than anything. And I wonder if, uh, if the professor might comment on that. <laughs> well, it's something that's left out of, of the flow of you know, what, what is going on. We don't see it's important. We don't understand how scared Europe was that it could be utterly submerged uh, under Islam. Yeah, Hungary was being invaded. Yeah. And uh, was it um, uh, St Stephen Hunyadi was trying to stop them, but the Europeans are fighting amongst themselves over this and ignoring yeah. you know, that. And the Pope yeah. was trying to get a crusade to protect Europe from that invasion. So you'd already had a kind of a crippling of the unity uh, of the church, and uh, it, it again, it's, it's, I guess it's a miracle that it didn't just break the dam, but you, what you see is the, the destruction of the unity of the church uh, leads political powers to pick up those pieces about whatever is handy for their rule. This is more obvious in Germany than other places because you have so many different uh, political entities there, and that destroys the kind of unity that can respond to what is basically a theological political assault. Uh, on Europe. Mm -hmm. So you've got fractured Europe now, and of course that makes it much easier to, to, uh, for them to gain control. Maybe it has its parallel right now in France and in England. You have the, an, such an entirely secularized uh, country there that they can't, they can't even understand what the Islamic threat is. And so they can't respond. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they want to try to absorb it. Okay, this is just one more religion. Can't we all be happy here? while not understanding the theological, political significance of what the Muslims are saying about what they are trying to do. Exactly. So they can't provide a response. Right. And, and that's why they don't need to attack France. All they need to do is move in and have families. And it's it, uh, something, too, in, in that background. One of the lines that Luther had at the time was, um, he would rather be a subject of the Turks than a subject of the Pope. I mean, that's... Yeah, they are. Now, he knew how, what he thought how bad the Pope was. He didn't really understand he, what no, it was no, like under no. the Turks. Yeah. But, you know, it was... That tension was there, and it was preventing Charles V, the emperor, mm -hmm. from getting the German princes to go to the help of the, um, uh, the, the Hungarians to prevent the uh, Turkish invasion. Mm -hmm. So it was a very difficult, very dangerous time. Yeah. You know, the Christian... Emperor and the French king were fighting, the religious stuff's going on, and the Turks at the doors was a mess. Yeah, yeah. Again, we want to encourage you to uh, get politicizing the Bible, the roots of historical criticism and the secularization of Scripture. Get at EWTN's religious catalog, which is EWTNRC.com, or call them at 1 800 
854-634-6316. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you all. I want to give you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by His peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you know, Dr. Weicker is doing a wonderful new series. He's got dra dramatized uh, episodes, and then he's also able to be here as a pinch hitter. And we can bring you these shows because you make this network possible. So keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Thank you.